With me now is Karen Maitland, the author of The Owl Killers. This is a fascinating novel about medieval times. Karen, welcome. I'm intrigued. What started your fascination with all things medieval? Well, I was living quite near the North Sea ferries at the time and I used to make frequent escape trips to Bruges, rather like Stephen Fry. And I became fascinated um, by an experience I had in Bruges when I went to um, a Beganage, the city of women there, which is mm -hmm. on the outskirts of Bruges. And I asked the um, guide there what Begins were and they told me that uh, they were um, nuns, a kind of nun, but they didn't sound like any nun I had ever come across. And then I went to the cathedral later on that afternoon and asked the same question. Mm. And he said with a sneer, they're all prostitutes. And oh. I thought, I, there is definitely a story here. So um, after that, I, I came home and I began to re research the medieval period and became absolutely fascinated with it. Your latest book is written with many voices and from various different perspectives, isn't it? What is The Owl Killers about? Yes, The Owl Killers is um, set in 1321 in a little country village in, on the east coast of England. And the village is ruled over by a pagan cult called the Owl Masters. And a group of Flemish Beggins come over from um, Bruges to try and set up a city of women, a beganage, on the, on, on the edge of this village. And of course the owl masters who are terrorising the village through murder and blackmail and um, all sorts of nasty, all sorts of nasty <laughs> things like that, um, immediately come into con conflict with the women. Um, the women, they're determined to get rid of the women and go back to the status quo. The women are equally determined to stay. And at the end of the, um, towards the end of the book, they realise that they may have to, to um, uh, sacrifice even more than their lives um, to, to try and defeat the Owl Masters. So. It's something of a masculine-feminine power struggle, isn't it? Who wins? Ah, I'm not <laughs> going to tell you that. <laughs> Um, what what is interesting is that the the owl masters um, follow this sort of cult of the of the owl man, which is a cult that actually um, is a is an actual medieval cult, and res and um, came to the forefront again in Cornwall in um, as recently as 1996. Um, really? So it's something that's still going on, um, you know, that people still mm. believe in. Then we'll have to read the book to find out. Now, I know you're going to read for us in a minute, but just before you do, I have one last question that intrigued me. You didn't start right at your writing career until you were in your 40s, did you? What kind of prompted that, that change of direction for you? I, having worked in Nigeria and also in Belfast at the height of the Troubles, um, I passionately wanted to write about what happened to people who were drawn into the fringes of terrorism um, and how the political reaction could actually make terrorists of people who were not um, politically minded. And so I, I sat down and wrote my first novel at that stage, which was called The White Room. and. Really, it all kicked off from there because that was shortlisted for a major award. And after that, I started to get commissions, so it was very good. But I'm oh, now awesome. firmly back in the Middle Ages, <laughs> very <laughs> firmly. <laughs> How marvellous. Thank you, Karen, for coming in today. I'm really looking forward to your Thank reading. Thank you. I'm going to read an extract from the prologue to The Owl Killers. The year is 1321, and it's the eve of May Day. Giles knew they would come for him sooner or later. He didn't know where or when. He didn't know what his punishment would be, but he knew there would be one. And now, tonight, they were finally here, crowded into the tiny room, their faces hidden behind the feathered owl masks, their clothes be concealed beneath long brown cloaks. For an instant, he was almost relieved, almost wanted them to get it over with, but then blind fear seized him and it was all he could do to stop himself falling on his knees and howling for mercy. With all her strength, his mother tried to force herself between Giles and the owl master who was gripping him. But the man lashed out with the back of his hand, catching the old woman across the mouth and sending her crashing against the wattle wall of the cottage. Giles, twisting himself free, 
ran to kneel over her, his hand braced against the wall as he tried to shield her with his own body. Is this your ancient code of justice, he demanded, beating defenceless women? Too late, he glimpsed a flash of metal, a sharp iron talon stabbed into his hand, impaling it to the wall. Four pairs of eyes buried deep within the feathers of the owl masks watched impassively as he writhed and sobbed. Finally, one of the owl masters wrenched the talon out and dragged Giles to his feet. Next time it will be your eyes, boy, and after that you'll not be able to see where we're about to strike. Giles knew his mother did not need to be told to hold her tongue. No one in those parts needed to be told that. As they dragged him out into the darkness, he glanced back at her. She stood in the dim yellow light of the solitary rush candle, tears streaming down her wrinkled cheeks, her hands clenched against her mouth. Even grieving must be done in silence. And as Giles prayed more fervently than he had ever done in his life for a miracle that would save him, a despairing voice inside him told him that miracles did not happen, not for him, not in Ulwich.